Hello, my name is Mahesh Ramanatham, and it's a real pleasure to be talking to you today on FDA's implementation experience with ICHQ-12. Hopefully today, be able to walk you through the foundations of the guideline and the guidance document for FDA, um, how to utilize some of the tools most efficiently, and also share with you what we've been seeing when it comes to the use of ICHQ-12 and submissions um, and their benefit to the application overall. All right. So you've seen this already, but I'll put up here just for fun anyway. Let's go ahead into the actual content of the presentation here today. Um, as a reminder, hopefully you all have read ICHQ-12. It has been out for four years now. Um, and our implementation guidance has been out for uh, two years. Hopefully you are all familiar with that. And if you are not, I highly encourage you to read those two documents um, as they really paint a broad picture of um, how to use ICQ-12, its goals, what it intends to achieve, and uh, best uh, ways to approach the tools. But for those that have not read it, ICHQ-12, as we call it, Technical and Regulatory Considerations for Pharmaceutical Product Lifecycle Management, um, really utilizes all the best tools in Q8 through Q11 to provide a framework to facilitate the management of post rule CMC changes in a more predictable and efficient manner. And really, the take home here is as applicants better utilize the tools that we have in ICH Q8 through Q11, it provides the opportunity to present scientific justifications to reduce the volume of elements that would be uh, CMC changes that require a filing to the agency and offer the opportunity to reduce the reporting categories that go along with it. So overall, less, uh, less things that need to be reported to the agency um, at a lower level if the tools are used correctly. And really that's summarized in that third bullet there, um, that when those when the Q8 through Q11 tools um, in the Q12 manner is used in a stronger fashion, opportunity for fewer established conditions when it's weaker um, or less robust, uh, it's likely going to be more established conditions for the applicant. Important note here is that the, the use of ICH Q12 is voluntary. Um, implementation is also flexible in the sense that the proposals for specified established conditions on a product lifecycle management document uh, can happen at any point in the life cycle. It can happen with the original application or it can come in as a uh, post approval supplement um, to identify and define uh, the established conditions for a particular application product. Um, it's also flexible in the sense that it can be used for as little or as much of the CMC sections of the application as the applicant desires. For example, it can be defining these EVECs for one specific unit operation. If that is where the applicant chooses to invest their time and resources in deploying ICHQ-12, it can be for everything uh, in module three, you know, from your drug substance and drug product, uh, manufacturing processes, uh, container closure systems, analytical methods, um, manufacturing facilities, et cetera. The uh, flexibility spans that spectrum. Okay. A little bit on where we are with ICHQ-12 from an FDA perspective, just to paint the overall picture um, before we go into more detailed discussion of the tools themselves. Um, so we adopted ICHQ-12 in 2021 as a step five document, and that replaced our 2015 draft guidance on established conditions. Um, that guidance was no longer necessary um, as ICHQ-12 became reality, and we can now point to that as official FDA policy. So in parallel to the adoption of ICHQ-12, the parent guideline there, we also published FDA's implementation considerations guidance, draft guidance document in 2021. And the goal there was to identify and clarify how applicants working in the FDA system can translate the terminology, translate the approaches um, to use here in the United States, as well as accounting for some specific frameworks um, to the FDA system uh, that still offer the opportunity for using using ICHQ-12 tools. So for example, using them in the frameworks of uh, referencing a drug master file, um, uh, using a drug product, uh, sorry, a drug device combination product and how to approach established conditions for those types of, of, of drugs, um, et cetera. And finally, what we are working on is a manual of policies and procedures, which is gonna really focus on specific procedures for the assessors on how different disciplines encountering ICHQ-12 tools, uh, specifically proposals for established conditions and reporting categories for those established conditions, are gonna work through the assessment, um, both from the application side of things and the assessment of facilities and the pharmaceutical quality system side of things, and how those come together 
to make initial decisions uh, in support of applications, as well as to maintain or how to respond to maintenance um, after approval of those particular applications. Okay, so the scope of ICHQ-12 itself, uh, this is a, a summary of the guideline, uh, so I won't read it verbatim, but the real take home message here is that when it comes to ICHQ-12 and the FDA, um, we've had no limitations on the scope. We are fully implemented across uh, anything that Q12 can be deployed to per the guidance. Um, we are open doors um, for that uh, for those approaches for applicants. All right, and similarly, we have a, a new number of tools in ICHQ12. And the point of this slide is not to go through every single one in detail, but to really highlight that uh, through these numerous tools that we have in ICHQ12, um, the applicant really should be looking at these as a suite. Um, how to utilize all of these uh, in conjunction or to the best of the ability to really open the door for maximum opportunities when it comes to justifying uh, fewer established conditions and lower reporting categories. Uh, again, the real take home here is that within uh, IFDA, um, we have fully implemented ICHQ-12, so all of these tools are open for business. Um, and again, coming down, back down to the applicant to decide um, how to best approach it um, uh, and pursue maximum benefit. I'm not gonna spend a time today going through every single one of these, I didn't want to bring particular attention to established conditions, uh, PACMPs, or as we call them in the United States, comparability protocols, uh, how it all works together in the product lifecycle management document, um, and then the pharmaceutical quality system being that underpinning and that foundation of um, efficient implementation of Q12. So what are established conditions? Um, if you haven't read uh, the guidance documents, uh, either the parent ICHQ12 or our implementation considerations guidance document, um, you know, this is a very important time <laughs> to pay attention and listen to what ECs are. Um, so ECs are legally binding information within the application considered necessary to assure product quality. As a result, in the context of ICHQ-12, um, as a result, any change to an established condition would require um, reporting to the regulator. Now, a big sort of take home message here is to recognize that an application today um, is a mixture of established conditions and supportive information. And some of those established conditions examples that we all see in front of us, uh, you know, could be the actual drug substance, the drug product formulation, the manufacturing process and its controls, the specifications, the facilities, et cetera. Uh, not uncommon, and hopefully is not news to anyone hearing this presentation, that when these elements are changed, there's an expectation um, for reporting to the, the application, whether it's a prior approval supplement or a change is being affected, et cetera, um, maintaining the file um, to account for what's currently going on in any one of these uh, particular areas that are established conditions. Um, but not everything in the application is an established condition. For example, uh, the data supporting method validation or the data supporting stability or the data supporting process validation or process development approaches. Um, those things, when they are maintained, don't themselves necessitate a filing to the application um, to gain approval from the regulator for any sort of change. We would consider that more supportive information. So the concept of established conditions, which exists today uh, in the regulatory frameworks, um, is really to highlight here that the application is a mixture of both. Uh, but when you change the established conditions element, uh, that file will have to come um, to the regulator for either a notification or approval. Um, a real important message, though, when it comes to Q12 implementation is that all changes, no matter whether they're reported to the application or not, require a, a change management approaches under the pharmaceutical quality system. Okay, so when it comes to Q12 implementation, I kind of mentioned this early on, but I'll come back to it again in the sense that the extent, i.e. the number and how narrowly defined of the established conditions will vary depending on multiple factors. So how much product and process knowledge does the applicant have? Um, what way do they gather it? How can they use that information to justify their proposals for established conditions? Um, and their, their grasp and kind of mastery of uh, demonstrating or, or showing the potential risk to product quality if that element were changed, uh, given their product and process understanding, et cetera. Now, after identifying the established conditions, Applicants can propose uh, various ways of managing those established conditions, i.e. how they would report them to the application. Um, a lot of flexibility here as well. Applicants can 
propose uh, and, and choose to follow existing regulations and guidance. For example, uh, here is a list of established conditions, but when changing them, I'm just going to follow, rather the applicant will just follow um, 21, 3, uh, 20, 21 CFR 314.70 if you're a small molecule product or 21 CFR 601.12 for a large molecule product and any implementing gui guidances on uh, the types of uh, reporting categories for, for specific changes, for example, the SUPAC guidances. Alternatively, an applicant has the opportunity to propose different reporting categories based on their knowledge of the product and process and their knowledge of risk uh, when managing a particular change. For example, an applicant can say uh, and propose in, in their uh, submission that even though SUPAC would have this particular change reported as a prior approval supplement, the development knowledge that's been gained, the platform knowledge that's, been, that's available, um, as well as the risk management assessment uh, of this particular established condition and its link to uh, quality attributes holds that we can change it, or rather it can be changed um, with a lower level of risk than what is normally expected um, or normally considered uh, to be the level of risk. Hence, let's report this as a change is being affected or even an annual report instead of a prior approval supplement. Those are opportunities that are available to the applicant depending on their desire uh, to pursue those, those proposals. And I'm happy to report that we have seen quite a few of them um, and have approved quite a few of them uh, dependent on justification provided by the applicant. Um, okay. Now this is a figure that we have from ICHQ12 itself. And I've always found it to be a fairly uh, good picture um, how to work through the thinking of what I just talked about in the previous slide as far as identifying the established conditions and then the reporting category. And you know the way that I think about it is above the red line there, those questions and outcomes are, are geared towards is the thing um, an established condition? Below the red line is, well, for that thing, uh, if it were changed, what would be the reporting category? And that top element there, this is a, a figure specific for uh, manufacturing process parameters. It can be applied in its thinking across different elements of CMC. Uh, for example, the performance uh, characteristics or primary performance characteristics for a device constituent part. Um, in our implementation guidance, we have uh, an adaptation of this figure um, to combination products. Um, you know, it can be applied to analytical methods and really focusing in on the you know, characteristics or elements of that method that assure performance uh, of that particular method. But here with process parameters, just to, to flesh it out even more, um, when we talk about uh, parameters, you know, looking at whether or not that parameter needs to be controlled to ensure product quality, and that can be thought of in a few ways. One, is it a, a critical process parameter, um, or is it a process parameter where the impact on quality cannot be reasonably excluded? There's not enough information yet, or there is some uh, signal of a potential uh, relationship, however more work needs to be done. And depending on the answer, yes or no, um, it could be determined an established condition or not an established condition. Um, if, it's, if the answer to those questions are no for this particular process parameter, uh, it could be reasonably justified as not an established condition, in which case it's not reported to the application. Now, that's not to say it's not managed um, and that all changes must be managed by the pharmaceutical quality system. It just provides the opportunity where that particular change doesn't require an annual report or a CBE or a PAS um, and the waiting for approval from the regulator. On the other hand, if you are an established condition, it will be reported to the application if changed. Um, and the second half of this diagram walks through how to apply Q9 type principles um, in considering the output of the criticality assessment and the control strategy to identifying the potential risk to product quality if that particular parameter was changed. Higher risks would trend, trend towards prior approval. Moderate or lower risks would trend towards notification type changes, which in our FDA system would be your CBEs and your annual reports. Okay, now I had previously talked about how the difference in uh, development approach or product and process knowledge and understanding available or platform knowledge available uh, could lead to differences in the established conditions. And what we have here is a screenshot from the ICHQ12 implementation working group training materials, um, which are available in ICHQ, uh, sorry, ICH.org. Um, if you search down and, and scroll to ICHQ12, there will be a link to our training modules. Um, and this is a screen grab from that particular, one of those, one of those um, uh, uh, presentations, excuse me. But what it shows here 
um, is that depending on the type of approach, uh, whether you know knowledge is gained in a very superficial fashion under a minimal parameter based uh, approach, uh, contrasted all the way to the right side of the screen, where there is a knowledge-rich environment of the interaction of parameters to quality attributes, um, such that you uh, and potentially even using technologies where there is online controls um, and ways of, of uh, you know feeding back information from the process um, into the control of that particular unit operation. Um, you know, uh, consider that a performance-based approach where there's maximal knowledge um, and control of the process itself. And what you can see is that now these are not meant to be three distinct approaches as far as the only ways of doing things, but they are meant to illustrate a spectrum um, of minimal knowledge to maximal knowledge. And along the spectrum, if you look left to, left to right, um, you will see that the things that are established conditions change as well as the reporting categories associated with them change to where on the left side you have more established conditions requiring filings to, this, to the application of change. For example, look at your equipment type, your vBlender. Uh, it is an established condition and if it were changed to a different type of equipment, it would be at least a CBE 30. Moving across the spectrum there, you know, uh, a situation where there is enhanced knowledge under a parameterized approach, uh, that risk might come down uh, to a, a lower notification, uh, notification low, potentially a CBE zero or an annual report, to the more uh, the other end of the extreme, under performance based, where perhaps the applicant is able to justify that the type of equipment doesn't even matter anymore, and it can be controlled as far as the quality of material can be controlled, uh, independent of the type of equipment, to where the applicant has full flexibility to change that equipment without reporting it to the agency. So let's shift gears a little bit here from established conditions now into another tool that's available in ICHQ-12, what we call the Post-Approval Change Management Protocol, or PACMP. In the US system, PACMP is the same as a comparability protocol. Please look at our current guidance on comparability protocols, and you'll find extreme congruence with the content that you see in ICHQ-12. Um, but for the purposes of the presentation, I might use PACMP and CP interchangeably. Um, if I do, I'm talking about the same thing. So a PACMP, what it does is provide predictability and transparency in terms of the requirements and studies needed to implement a change. Um, and if those requirements and studies requirements are met and studies are, are conducted as expected in that change management protocol, providing the opportunity for a lower reporting category when implementing the change. The beauty of a PACMP um, is that it can be utilized for one or more changes to a single product or maybe you could use across products when that change is common um, and the characteristics of that change is common across products. For example, you know, potentially a, uh, you know, a simple liquid formulation injectable product utilizing a container closure system, glass vial and stopper. Um, think about the opportunity to uh, change the glass vial and stopper for multiple products at the same time using the same protocol. Uh, PACMP, much like established conditions, has extreme flexibility in when it can be proposed to the regulator and that can be submitted with the original application or subsequently as a standalone supplement. Okay, so what could that look like with a PACMP? So with a uh, change management protocol, step one will usually involve the submission of the written protocol in the form of a prior approval supplement to the regulator, and that will go over the tests, the studies, the acceptance criteria, et cetera, where the regulator can then look at the plan, look at the proposed outcomes of the plan and provide feedback or concurrence in form of approval um, to that particular supplement back to the, uh, the applicant. If approved, we now have that transparency built in on how to approach a particular change uh, between the applicant and the regulator. Step two is then the applicant actually carrying out the tests and studies in the protocol. Um, and if everything goes as expected, uh, the results of the data generated meets the acceptance criteria, any other conditions specified uh, in the approval of step one, um, that information will then be submitted to the regulator pursuant to the reporting category agreed upon, usually a lower reporting category than what would normally be expected, um, and can go forward with implementing that change. Uh, this can be done potentially at a notification type level, for example, a CBE um, or an annual report, giving more flexibility for, for streamlined and quicker change implementation. Um, however, depending on the category, you know, there may be situations where certain changes might need to come in at a prior approval supplement. For example, if the uh, uh, protocol acceptance criteria were not met or if significant changes had to be made to the protocol, or if the risk of the change 
was agreed upon to be just too high uh, to necessitate a notification or support notification. Okay. So you might be asking yourself, what's the difference then between established conditions and a change management protocol? Um, in reality, they are fairly well aligned and pretty close together. Um, and they all share some common characteristics, which you can see on the first three rows there. A major difference is that with a change management protocol, you are getting the uh, alignment up front um, on the approach and studies and access criteria and defining those up front um, to the regulator in the form of a uh, submission of the protocol to the application. With the established conditions, it's a much wider open sort of approach uh, in the sense that the applicant is justifying uh, what would need to be reported and at what level based on the available either development knowledge or platform uh, product and process knowledge um, at the time of that submission um, and giving you know flexibility through that sort of mechanism. All in all, this all comes together in the product lifecycle management document um, or the PLCM as it's called in ICHQ 12. And the PLCM is a central repository of the established conditions, the reporting categories, details on the details of the established conditions. For example, if it's a, a process parameter, the range of that process parameter um, or the controls around it, um, specificity in the reporting categories, so not only one will it follow uh, US regulation and guidance, um, or is it something different that's proposed? For example, a lower reporting category, um, but also clarity on uh, potential situations where the reporting category could be different. For example, if uh, going you know, uh, beyond the lower end of a range uh, is a lower risk, that might be a lower reporting category than going uh, beyond the higher end of the range, that might be a higher risk and a higher reporting category. So directional-based reporting categories um, having an opportunity in the PLCM as well. Uh, now, after so all the ECs in the reporting category should be proposed and transparently uh, captured on the PLCM. After approval, uh, the applicant should be maintaining the PLCM with an updated list uh, every time they make a change to an established condition, um, as well from a pharmaceutical quality system management perspective, um, looking at opportunities to uh, identify changes to ECs overall, um, those should be provided to the regulator too. So I mentioned early on about our draft guidance, uh, ICHQ 12 implementation considerations for FDA regulated products and kind of what that does. Um, I had already mentioned sort of, um, you know, how to use the ICHQ 12 tools in our system and accounting for our frameworks. Um, but the guidance does go into specific considerations that applicants should be aware of to be most effective in utilizing Q12 in the FDA system. So for example, clarity in the cover letter regarding proposed ECs to be as explicit as possible that this submission contains proposals for established conditions and a PLCM in module 32R in the application, for example. Um, clearly, and uh, clearly, sorry, clear and specific identification of the ECs in the PLCM, the reporting category and justification. So, you know, uh, being as black and white as possible um, in the PLCM about what is the established condition, what is the reporting category, um, and not being vague about it. Um, and clearly indicating the facilities uh, in the PLCM, clearly indicating where those established conditions will be implemented. For example, if we're talking about uh, established conditions for the drug product manufacturing process, to clearly concatenate any established conditions associated with the manufacturing process under the facility identifier um, for the drug product manufacturing operation. So we had briefly talked about um, kind of the PQS being the foundation uh, of ICHQ-12 implementation in that you know, while only some uh, changes will be reported to an application, all changes are expected to be managed by the PQS. Um, and kind of diving into further about why this is so foundational to Q12 implementation uh, in that the effectiveness of a PQS really provides confidence in the proposals for established conditions. Uh, by allowing the regulator to see that there's a feasible and robust control strategy, that we have competent quality oversight for maintenance activities post-approval, that we are confident that all relevant data has been uh, assessed and considered, um, uh, anything that's been generated by a particular facility, and that the change management procedures are, are competent. Um, we go on to talk about in ICHQ-12 about how an effective change management process across the supply chain, across facilities that are linked up together 
and making a particular product is essential because we really can't be thinking about the risk of changes within the silo of one particular uh, element. It really needs to be broadened out and at least account for upstream um, or downstream impact. Um, and I mentioned this on the previous slide about maintenance. Really, knowledge gained, knowledge gained during the commercial phase is a, is a key element of that post-approval confidence uh, that even after approval of a PLCM and the appropriate, uh, sorry, the established conditions, that as new knowledge is gained during manufacturing operations or changes in suppliers, uh, routine stability, et cetera, um, that there is a periodic reassessment of criticality and risk and searching for any needed changes to established conditions, which goes both ways in the sense that an applicant might learn something that gives them the opportunity to reduce the established conditions, um, to remove something that was previously thought of as a risk, but maybe is no longer uh, with the uh, additional knowledge gained. Um, alternatively, the opportunity to add established conditions uh, for better life cycle control if new risks emerge in the context of routine operations, et cetera. Uh, this diagram he uh, here is from ICHQ12, and it really puts into a picture um, the relationship between the pharmaceutical quality system um, managing changes uh, inside of a particular facility or at the applicant level managing changes. And on the red part of that diagram, um, the linkage up to established conditions and notification. So you see that the change management lifecycle is really agnostic uh, to whether or not it needs to be filed to the application and that all changes are being sort of managed under a consistent approach. And then in certain cases, the red dotted line um, over to the red box, in certain cases, some of those changes need to be reported to the application. What Q12 is doing is essentially making that red box smaller. Um, or giving the opportunity for applicants to justify a smaller red box than what would be normally expected under regulation and guidance. But all of it kind of really depends on the effectiveness of the PQS. Um, and knowing that this cycle, this approach, um, is going to be uh, well implemented. Okay. So thinking about pharmaceutical quality systems, what would it mean for inspections? Um, so if you are an investigator uh, or if you are being, uh, if your facility being inspected, uh, when it comes to Q12 implementation, there's no expectation for investigators to review established conditions. Um, that will be done through the application with the assessors at headquarters. Um, however, the inspection is an opportunity to gather information on the effectiveness of the pharmaceutical quality system. Um, and for those that are paying attention, you will notice that we have updated our surveillance compliance programs and our pre-approval inspection compliance programs to add content um, about advanced pharmaceutical quality systems, about the change management eff effectiveness, et cetera, that in part supports um, ICHQ-12 implementation. Uh, so as investigators looking at kind of these other areas of the quality system, particularly change management, uh, it will help gain uh, more evidence and more knowledge and more insight that can further drive flexibilities in uh, Q12 proposals from applicants, or at least our assessment of them. Um, but important to also know that if an inspection identifies a violative situation to facility, um, it may impact the approval established conditions. It may also impact the viability of previously approved uh, established conditions to where changes might need to be reported at normal levels under regulation and guidance until such time as that facility is out of a state of um, violative compliance status. All right, so what have we done to get ourselves in a position to implement Q12? Um, long story short, we started five or six years ago on training FDA assessors and investigators on what ICHQ12 is, um, how to think about the, uh, the, the change in thinking when it comes to letting science and risk drive some of their proposals for established conditions. Um, you know, that went all the way from theoretical examples to the you know, output of the pilot assessments that we did in 2019, all the way through implementation of Q12 and the, uh, the implementation considerations guidance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this, this uh, also impacted the inspection compliance programs. These train, this training and this exposure, you know, was available or, or deployed to our assessors in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, our colleagues in the Office of Regulatory Affairs doing the inspections. Um, as well as colleagues in the Office of New Drugs and Generic Drugs for awareness on what Q12 is and what it could mean um, to applications as they come in the door. In the day-to-day -day operations, now that we've uh, opened the door and applications are coming in, um, we found the need to ensure continuity in the assessment 
um, in the early stages, especially as you know assessors were really starting to see submissions in real time. Um, so we we stood up two groups: uh, the Established Conditions Coordinating Committee and the Q12 Assessment Implementation Team. The ECCC is really there to provide regulatory support to the assessment teams, helping them think through the policy, think through congruence with ICH Q12 and ensuring that any decisions or communications or language that we send back and forth to the applicant is supported by that policy. Whereas the Q12 assessment implementation team, um, members there you know, represent our senior scientific folks across disciplines. We're there to help the teams really think about criticality assessments, risk assessments, and whether or not proposals for ECs are well justified. Um, in addition to those two groups, a member from each one of those two groups joining the assessment team, we will also have a new uh, discipline, a pharmaceutical quality system assessor, join the team to really look at those facilities where ECs are going to be implemented uh, and whether or not there are any concerns with pharmaceutical quality system health, change management effectiveness, et cetera, that could influence decisions around um, established conditions and reporting categories. So here's a snapshot um, from the pilot implementation through September of 2023 of the types of applications that have come on board and sort of where we are with status. Um, and as you can see, the concentration is really in the inter innovator space. I mean, at this time is really in the supplement space too, where we're looking at uh, proposals coming forward for established products, um, you know, have been improved uh, fairly recently and prior approval supplements are now coming in to, you know, define a list of established conditions and reporting categories. Um, you know, a lot of activity in the biologic license application space, in the new drug application space, but not a lot of have activity in the ANDA space. Where we are right now is a, a lot of supplements coming in. We're starting to see things start to tip over into more original applications um, coming in the door uh, to, to actually build in this flexibility uh, on the day of approval, um, uh, which is a good, I think, sign <laughs> for things to, things to come. But again, this is designed to be flexible, so it can happen at any point in time in the life cycle. For example, if a business model holds that it's not viable to do this at the original application stage, but it's better after there's an established product, um, that door will always be open for applicants to come in with PASs after approval um, and reduce their supplement burden um, and implementation in a global space. Um, the types of ECs that we have seen, kind of the flavor of them, so we have seen everything from uh, proposals to reduce the volume of reporting, uh, sorry, volume of established conditions uh, where reporting categories are consistent with the regulation and guidance. We've also seen, um, you know, the, the, actually the bulk of the proposals where the reporting category, category proposals are more flexible um, than uh, regulation and guidance. Um, and it's been really nice to see the supporting justification for both the established conditions and the reporting categories, um, which by and large have left us in situations where we can approve these applications. We've seen a mix of the types of ECs, um, you know, whether it's a parameter-based approach or a performance-based approach, where there's a lot of knowledge, maybe some feedback mechanisms, et cetera. Um, but happy to say we've seen this across the spectrum for both manufacturing processes, analytical methods. Um, we're starting to see uh, proposals for uh, device constituent parts of a drug device combination product um, and uh, you know a very positive element as far as applicants proactively specifying by facility um, where the established conditions will be implemented for example you know we've had a few applications with uh, dual facilities doing the same operation for a particular product um, and the ECs within each facility are a little bit different by virtue of differences in equipment um, differences in operations and controls, uh, but nonetheless, having that clear specificity on the PLCM allows for you know confidence in the approval uh, as far as what we are approving and the ability to drive the uh, PQS assessment. So our reflections, um, you know, the next couple of slides are going to go over uh, things that we have seen, um, also kind of you know allude to common information requests that we're sending back to applicants um, to uh, get clarity on particular proposals. Um, but reflections from our initial experience, really what helps Q12 implementation, or at least the submissions um, uh, for Q12, are clarity in the cover letter um, so that the agent, agency can start off immediately um, in assessing these uh, applications with the right teams 
I mentioned on a previous slide that we have three additional members of the team joining when an application includes proposals for ECs and alternate reporting categories um, in order to get them on board at the right time. Seeing it up front in the cover letter is incredibly important. Um, so whether that's proposing ECs or revisions to already approved ECs um, or, or as simple as making changes in accordance with approved ECs, um, it's important to have that kind of clarity so that we can tailor the teams appropriately and maximize the time um, in assessing these applications. Scientific justification is a huge element when it comes to the success of Q12 um, applications and their approvability. Um, really like, you know, looking at these three sort of bullets here, the justifications really need to focus on explaining the approach to criticality assessment. You know, early on, we got an inkling that some applicants were worried that what was in Q12 uh, would be calling them to change their company uh, approach to risk assessment or criticality assessment to conform to what was there in Q12. And that's not the ask. The ask is a clarity in explaining how uh, an applicant went about criticality assessment and risk assessment so that uh, the team is when they're assessing these proposals for ECs and reporting categories has the contextual understanding about why the applicant is proposing you know, a certain level of criticality or a certain reporting category level um, to then frame out whether the justification makes sense. So the ask is not to change, the ask is to explain so that the assessors know what they're looking at. Um, again, that's the second bullet there, right? That the uh, justifications and risk assessments should clearly describe the scientific rationale for why something is considered an EC, or in some cases, why something that would normally be considered an established condition is not in this case. Um, same thing for the reporting categories. And one thing to highlight here, especially if an applicant is considering filing a PAS to uh, document established conditions or gain approval for ECs for an already approved application, is to really ensure that the justifications for those ECs and reporting categories are current um, and are actually justifying the ECs and the reporting categories and not just the parameters that were approved for the process. Um, in more than one situation, we saw justifications that were pointing back to data um, or, or studies conducted for the original application approved you know, five or 10 years ago to where they even, even the thinking around established conditions didn't exist. The justifications didn't really make sense. Um, so really think about when you are proposing ECs and reporting categories that are using the principles in Q12 and the implementation guidance to frame things in the right way uh, to support justifications for why this particular element should be an established condition, why the reporting category should be at this level, et cetera. Okay, um, some more reflections. The PLCM. Um, really needs to include all the ECs for that relevant ECTD section. Um, you know, we found a few situations where looking at module three and looking at the justifications, what would what was identified by the applicant as critical for control, critical quality attributes, or the direct linkage there, did not show up on the PLCM, um, and there was no explanation of it. So we had to um, uh, rectify that difference. Um, as well, the PLCM should clearly state the record, reporting category uh, when different than regional regulation and guidance, or be really clear that we're following regional regulation and guidance, and should do so in U.S. terms. Um, there have been uh, a few times where we, you know, applicants have used the Q12 terminology, and we've had to, we've had to go back and clarify specifically what do you mean for a U.S. filing? When you say notification moderate, does that mean CBE 30 or CBE 0? We need to be explicit um, so that the agency has confidence in what we're approving. In the same way, the PLCM, I mentioned this earlier, needs to be clear about the, uh, the facility identifiers where those ECs are being approved. Um, again, because that's going to drive um, FDA's assessment of the pharmaceutical quality system, um, which is really looking at you know, which facilities will be implemented, but also depending on the level of flexibility proposed, that will tailor the depth of assessment um, of the pharmaceutical quality system. So where uh, you know, there is flexibility in established conditions proposed or lower reporting categories than we normally expect. You know, our assessors look more into those ICHQ10 principles of uh, change management, effectiveness, et cetera, uh, to see if the, you know, the, the support is there um, to maintain ECs post-approval. By and large, our interactions with applicants have been fairly positive, um, you know, receptive to our information requests, modifications that are necessary to the PLCM have been made. In some cases, 
uh, you know, after, when, like, for example, when asking for justification or clarification, um, applicants, I think, have, have withdrawn uh, proposals for established conditions if they particularly weren't ready to justify them. Um, and in the case of a prior rule supplement on such a short clock, um, but they have been the minority, um, count them on one hand, uh, where these situations have happened. Um, and happy to report that to date, we've not denied approval of an application due to Q12. So very good success across the board so far, and I hope we continue that and expand it to more application types um, and more stages in the product life cycle. We are so supportive of Q12 and its benefits uh, to pharmaceutical product quality management um, and the life cycle, for example, in being more agile uh, and making changes to avert shortages or respond to shortages or increases in demand, um, that we have applied Q12 principles during the pandemic, for example, with um, container closure system changes. Uh, we continue to address common misperceptions and questions by engaging with the industry and uh, other regulatory partners. And we've been supporting global implementation of the tools, for example, PACMPs, um, in various forums. Um, we continue to support the ICHQ-12 implementation working group. The ICMARA pilots had a big focus on PACMPs and the approach to risk assessment. And we continue to share our experience with other regulators to help uh, you know, lower the global activation energy when it comes to the adoption of Q-12. And not to mention um, our linkage to of Q-12 to other related ICH guidance documents, for example, F4Q and Revision 2, but also looking ahead into ICHQ14, um, where we talk about analytical methods, um, and you can even see the DNA in ICHQ13 uh, when it comes to continuous manufacturing. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. A huge thanks to the ICHQ12 teams across the world, uh, whether it's the expert, implementa expert working group or the implementation working group. Huge thanks to the FDA ICHQ12 uh, EWG and IWG teams, um, some key members here. Um, but uh, you can see on the third bullet there, the network is much, much broader than that uh, when it comes to our uh, support teams, our ECCC teams, and our Q12 assessment and inflation teams. Um, you know, the thanks cannot be uh, ex uh, repeated enough. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap up and i um, happy to engage with you further. Thank you very much.